so what we've got here, so I've switched over, and again, these, these three, these are my nodes, and these are running in my data center attached to a, a, an ACI fabric. And so on top of here, what I can do is we can do those same types of Kubernetes commands. So I can do the kubectl git, and we'll, we've got deployments, but we're going to jump right to the pods concept. So pods, and I'll do this dash o wide again. Oops, wide. And so now we can see inside of my deployment here, or inside of my cluster, I have my My Hero application running. So I've got My Hero app, My Hero app, the data, the Ernst, all of those pieces, and then the UI. And we can see that here's, here's actually a good way to kind of see the difference. We'll see the nodes 02 and 03 are where these are running. You don't see 01 because that's the master node. It's not, it's, it's handling all the orchestration that's there. And we can see that each one, each one of these guys has an IP address that's there. And so let's take a look at what this looks like because this Kubernetes cluster, all of the networking under the hood is actually being managed by ACI. I've pre-integrated Kubernetes with my ACI environment. And so I'm gonna switch over to my APIC here. And so inside of my APIC, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna look at the tenant that corresponds to this Kubernetes cluster. And so this is running off of one of our DevNet sandboxes. I'll talk more at the end about how if, you're, if viewers wanna kind of do this demonstration themselves, I've got all this built, you can certainly do this. So we'll, we'll hit that at the end. But for now, I'm on SBX04, and we can see SBX04, SBX04. So that's my Kubernetes cluster that I'm using. And so I'll, when this comes through, we'll have the ability to actually see visibility into all of the elements that are going through. Now, hopefully um, the viewers out there have got a little bit of knowledge and have had some experience with ACI, um, but I'll talk about some of the key elements as we go through. A top level object inside of ACI is the tenant. The tenant is this structure that we can do some isolation, we can deploy applications, we can kind of have access control at that level. And then inside of a tenant are what are called application profiles. And the application profile is the grouping of some, some pieces of an application that we want to control. And so in this case, the Kubernetes application. And then inside of an application profile, we have what are called endpoint groups. And these are the segmentations of, of how we're actually going to segment workloads and resources inside of our data center. Um, the loosest, it's not a one-for-one one analogy, but a great way to kind of think about uh, the view, um, the EPG is, is kind of the, the, the isolation you would get from a VLAN. Is it's this area that I just want to group a bunch of like, uh, like things together. And so in our, in our first demonstration, this kube default, this EPG is actually where all of my, my applications or my pods or my containers are going to be attached to my ACI fabric. And so if I come through here and I look at what's called the operational view, inside of ACI, the operational view is actually where I can look at the things that are running on my fabric. And lo and behold, here we can see the actual pods or what we're actually interested in is containers that are running inside of Kubernetes. I can see them all by name. I can actually see the MAC addresses that have been assigned kind of under the hood by Kubernetes and Docker. Um, I can see the virtual machine or the, the IP addresses that are there. So these align to the same ones that we saw with Kubernetes. I can see the hosting server. And if I wanted to, I could actually see the physical network interface where this is coming out of the, the server that is the Kubernetes node and making its way into the actual physical fabric. So I can actually track this all the way through kind of what's going in. And so this is the first bit we get. I don't have any segmentation done because as you can see, everything is still kind of in one grouping but at the very least, now I've got some visibility and control. Um, if you've done anything with ACI, maybe you're familiar with some of the ability to do debugs and stats and counters. What, because the container is seen as kind of what we like to call first class citizens, it's a top level object to ACI, I can get containers and counters and health scores and everything down at the container level. And this is a um, very unique level of visibility kind of at that kind of networking layer because I could have uh, virtual machines and physical servers treated exactly the same way as these individual containers that are here um, because I see them the same way. I don't have, as far as ACI is concerned, a virtual machine, a physical server, and a container all show up the exact same way inside of the fabric. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think what we should do, Hank, because some guys will say they don't know ACI is, if, if you're okay with it, perhaps in a later call, we can have a, a demonstration mm -hmm. of ACI and you can give us some foundations of ACI. Yeah. Or I suppose they can take your course because you mentioned that free course and that covers ACI as well, doesn't it? 
Well, so the course will go through the, the programmability elements of ACI. So the APIs that are available, how to work with it in Python. If, if you're interested in kind of just what ACI is as a networking technology, um, there are some, I don't cover those usually because I'm focused on the programmability pieces, but I can definitely make some recommendations um, to some sessions that have been done at Cisco events and Cisco Live, or I'd certainly be happy. We could take some time on a future call too to just do some fundamentals of ACI as well. That's certainly something we can, we can tack in as well. Yeah, that would be great. If you can give me some links, I'll put it below this video for yep. if, if you've got those to hand. And then, um, yeah, perhaps we can do it later. I think um, it, it's always nice to get your perspective, even if you mm -hmm. just give us a generic overview of it, because oh, then yeah. it's consistent with what you're teaching us, you know, through through these videos. So perhaps later yeah. on, you can just give us a general overview of, of, of ACI. Great. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Okay. So now that we've, we've seen what we've got here, let's actually revisit the problem I mentioned about segmentation. And so what I want to show is, is inside of this, this, this listing, we've got the My Hero app, and then I've also put in what I've called the dev box. And the dev box in this case is just another running container that I happen to give myself access to. So the idea here is this is, this is some container that a, a security person has. Um, let me give me one second to hide the... Alerts coming through. Um, so the idea here is that this dev box is is a is a running microservice that maybe some security guy or a hacker has 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 gotten access to. He's he's infiltrated. He's he's overtaken it. And so now I've got access to a running instance inside of my cluster. And so this tells me that in here's I could go ahead and access these individual addresses. So let's say I wanted to make a direct API call to the data service. And so I've got some nefarious purposes and I wanted to, to mess around with the data from this voting capability. Maybe I wanted to make sure that my favorite superhero won and I wasn't willing to do it in a fair fashion. I just wanted to go ahead and hack away at it. And so from here, I can first, let's see, can I access the data container? And it looks like I can, I can ping it. So that's my first step. So I show that I've got connectivity to that data container. Now let's say, I know that there's an API there, so let's say that I wanted to make an API call directly to the data service, which is something that you would never want an application kind of UI doing. You certainly don't want um, somebody getting unauthorized access to your data service. And so I'll just use that same curl command, and I'm gonna go ahead and say, okay, dash H, and um, through, through some means, I've figured out what the actual security key is so that I can authenticate. And I'm gonna say, oops, 30, uh, 5,000 options. And we can see right here, I've been able to access directly into the data service to going through. And so this is where some of the, the necessity around segmentation starts to come in is we don't, this is not something we want, right? We want to be able to provide isolation between and secure access and all of those areas to go through. And so the default behavior around Kubernetes of just putting everything on the same layer two area well, that doesn't solve the security piece. By connecting ACI and Kubernetes together, I got visibility. There's value in that all on its own, but this doesn't give me the ability to do security. You following the kind of the the, the logic here, David? Yeah, yeah. I, 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 you, you, I'm assuming eventually we're going to talk about micro segmentation. If, if I haven't missed that, sorry. Yep. So micro segmentation for me is often kind of a term that's that's coupled into virtual machines and like v, uh, v center pieces. Yeah. I, I'm just going to refer to it as just basic segmentation at this point, because what I want to do is rather than have, let me switch back to Kubernetes here, or ACI for a second, rather than have each and every single one of these endpoints running in a single segment, a single EPG, I've already prepped my ACI fabric with a new application profile called My Hero, and then inside of here, I've got EPGs for each one of the tiers. And so what I want to do is I actually want my application to get deployed and be deployed so that I can control security policies and I can provide the proper types of access between the tiers that are there. And so this is where the segmentation piece comes through. Now, if you wanted to do this today in a traditional kind of just Kubernetes on your own, what you would have to do is you would actually have to have different Kubernetes um, worker nodes and maybe even cluster, though there's logic where you can get behind this, but but at the very least, individual worker nodes for each one of these security tiers so that you could then deploy your, your different um, containers to the ones that live in the security zone so that you could then use physical networking or other elements to kind of control the traffic. The value of what we're going to do here with ACI and Kubernetes is I'm not going to do that. 
I've just got the two worker nodes that are used for load balancing. And I'm gonna do the segmentation within the, the actual Kubernetes and Docker and Linux networking stack, but I'm gonna be injecting ACI logic and ACI control and visibility at that layer so that we can go through. So let's go ahead and, and dive into that piece for a little bit here. So the first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go in and I'm gonna deploy a new version of this application. Well, you know, I'm gonna uninstall this one just so we don't get confused. So I've, I've made myself some, some uninstall scripts and things to make this easier. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete the My Hero application from this kind of, uh, we'll call it the insecure version of that. And so it's just running a bunch of Kubernetes commands to uninstall the deployments that were out there. And that's what's going through here. Um, Can I'll I ask you some dumb questions? Oh, absolutely. they won't be dumb, I promise, but go ahead and ask. <laughs> So just taking it back to old style networking, in the old days, we used to have like say one switch, everything was in one VLAN, you, you would have multiple physical servers, mm -hmm. and then the, old, the only way to segment those or to implement some kind of segmentation or separation was uh, to create a VLAN. So you'd have some servers in one VLAN, another server in another VLAN, and then you'd create access lists to block that. Mm -hmm. But so just going, you know, over history. So then we, we, we also moved to the thing where we could have a single VLAN and then we could have a VLAN access control list, VACL type thing. So they could mm -hmm. be in the same subnet, but then we could separate them. But so as an analogy is what you said, if you didn't have ACI, the guy who was using Kubernetes would have to logically do something like that, where they have the servers somehow separated and it would be mm -hmm. a nightmare to try and keep the security policies in place. Whereas if I understand this right from a high level, I'm using a graphical user interface, um, which is ACI, uh, connected to Kubernetes. Um, so kind of like in VMware, where I, I just have this management interface and it's just doing a bunch of stuff in the background. That's kind of what's happening here. The intelligence is in the application that Cisco have written. And I'm just saying, put these into this EPG is the term I think you used. And mm -hmm. then it just separates it kind of automatically kind of thing. Is that right? Exactly. And, that, and that's what we're going to do is, is we're going to be using this linkage between Kubernetes and ACI. And so when I deploy it here in a second and I redeploy the My Hero application, there'll be a bit of extra logic that we put into what's called an application definition. And I'll, I'll show it in just a second. Um, Kubernetes, the way that you deploy an application to Kubernetes is you tell it, this is the container we need to run. Um, these are some of the settings that are needed as far as the pieces go through. And we're going to add a bit that says, okay, also put this, this deployment, so put this microservice into this EPG. And so the application developer, when they do it, the only change that they have is they've talked to the security people or they've talked to the networking people and said, okay, for this production application, these are the these are the tiers, these are the microservices. Um, which which networking policy do we attach to it? And they just add it to the exact same application definition that they're already building anyway. And it's this this just what's called an annotation inside of Kubernetes, and it's just a bit of metadata or just a bit of extra information that Kubernetes and ACI can use together to make sure that those individual running containers get put into the proper security zone. And there's lots of ways to set it up, but in a, in a fully secure production deployment, if a, if a developer didn't put those in, those containers would just show up in, in what I would probably usually call like a quarantine zone. And so they would show up in like an area where they're kind of isolated because they didn't have the right policy applied. And so that's this, this is where the, um, the connection between the application developers, the networking team, and the security team start to come together as they deploy these applications. And so all of the planning is done, and then the application developers can do their deployments without having to ask security or networking team to go add a new port or, or relink or create a new VLAN. All the logic and design is done up front, and then it's just deployed on that side so that the linkages go through. Does that make sense? Yeah, so I think for those guys who haven't seen like a good example of software-defined networking, this seems mm -hmm. to be a good example of that where in the old days we did everything on the CLI, we manually configured access lists, firewall policies, et cetera. This has given me a huge level or high level abstraction if, if, I'm, if I'm making sense that I'm doing it through a GUI interface and then policies are written through software um, to actually implement the high level sort of rules or policies that I've got. Is, is that correct to say that this is an example yeah. of SDN? 
Yeah, I, I would absolutely say SDN is, there's a lot that fits into that bucket, but this is definitely yeah. software-defined networking. And what's even better than that, it's it's this this application integrated networking piece. And I, I'm not an acronym coiner, but, but that's the part yeah. that I like about this example <laughs> is we're actually bringing the applications, in this case, our app is this My Hero web app, microservice web app, together with the actual networking pieces under the hood. So these aren't, these aren't separate steps. These, there isn't a handoff. We're actually able to do this at the, the application development piece because we're bringing the worlds together. We're connecting our network technology, ACI, to our, our infrastructure platform for modern applications, Kubernetes together. So let's, let's see what this looks like as we go through so we can go. So I'm just gonna change into a different directory. And so inside of here, I've got an install script. And so I'm gonna run it and then we'll talk about what it's doing and we'll see the results. So I'm gonna do my hero install. So this is going to reinstall the application, but rather than doing it is where they all just get kind of bucketed together in this default kind of wild, wild west of networking, we're gonna put them into these deployment spots. And so each one of these microservices will have its policy applied. So Hank, I think, you know, just for guys who are perhaps not so familiar with ACI and and Kubernetes and stuff. This is like a real paradigm shift for a network engineer. So rather than me connecting to the CLI and manually configuring commands, and sorry to hop on this, I just wanna make this distinction. Mm -hmm. Our jobs are changing now, aren't they? Where we yeah. are doing more stuff with software. So we're using perhaps a GUI interface to deploy policies across multiple servers. And I mean, mm -hmm. just to make the point, this is more data center focused than um, enterprise um, or campus focused. Well, but yeah, go on, sorry. Yeah, so I, I think you've got it. So the, the job of the network engineer is changing. For the longest time, network engineers were, were kind of defined or their work was defined by using the CLI and configuring routers and switches. Um, but, but what we should have been realizing that what our job was, our job was designing, building and operating networks and networks are more, today, particularly today, I would say that they, they always were, but particularly today, the network is way more than just the physical routers and switches and these pieces that are there. The network also includes things like Kubernetes, which is where we're providing network connectivity between running containers. The network includes things like cloud connectivity and how do we manage kind of um, database as a service in these pieces that go through. So the, the job of the network engineer is to build, design and operate networks. The tooling, the, the ways that we do that are what are changing more than ever. It's, it's not the, the fundamental kind of mission of the network engineer that's changed. It's just kind of the scope and, and kind of what networks we're touching. And this is an example. To your point about data center, this particular example, this idea behind kind of integrating with Kubernetes and deploying and, and managing the networking behind microservice applications, this is a data center slash cloud topic, but the move to SDN, the, the creating policies to define networking, that's not just a data center piece. Um, if we go to an, an enterprise or a campus example that kind of has similar corollaries, is what we're finding more and more often is, is every, every business office or every corporate office I go to or college campus or, or hospital, we're seeing more and more IP connected things pop up. Soda machines, video cameras, um, security devices, uh, PlayStation 4s so that the, the kids in the peds wing can go through. Well, when we think about that, how are we gonna control and access and, and manage the policy and onboard all of those types of devices, right? Every, every pop machine that has a, has a network connection or a wireless connection is kind of the, the microservice or the container version in the campus world. And we're going to need different ways to manage and operate those. It won't be Kubernetes, but it's going to be some element of SDN and policy and all of these other pieces um, that are still going to change from, from raw CLI pushes for network configurations to some of these other toolings that are there. Does that analogy or rough make sense? And is, is that kind of aligned with what you're seeing too, David? Yeah, no, that, I think that's a great explanation. I think the um, network engineers for a long time, well, this whole SDN thing is making guys worried that they'll lose their jobs. And I don't think that's true, the jobs will change. So you won't be manually configuring a VLAN perhaps the same way that you, you did in the past, but you still have to understand networking, you still have to understand how this stuff works. But um, like, as you said, the, 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 tooling or, the tooling, sorry, or the way that you do it may mm -hmm. change. And I think this is a great example that you've got here. So just to make sure that I understand, this is 
all running in Google's cloud. Everything you're showing us here is in the cloud. Is that right? So the first example was, so when we were looking at kind of the basic Kubernetes and those pieces, that was a Kubernetes cluster running in Google's cloud. Um, with this connection with ACI and Kubernetes, I'm, I'm switching to a, a, the DevNet sandbox because in this case, we need, the, we need the, the ACI network to plug into Kubernetes. And so oftentimes what we're gonna find there is where we're gonna have, um, this is gonna be inside of a data center uh, owned. In this case, this is gonna be a DevNet sandbox that goes through. And as I mentioned, all of the, the demos that we're gonna run through here with this ACI Kubernetes integration is something that any of the viewers can reserve one of our sandboxes and kind of replicate right. on their own. But it's, it's also I mean, the point I was trying the, the point I was trying to make is what's really nice here is as you said, um, net the, the different types of networks. So you were running networks in Google, so that that was mm -hmm. a type of network, like three types of networks. Oh, Here's absolutely. another example of a network. It's it's perhaps a DevNet um, data center, but it, it it's not like networking in the traditional sense. Like here I've got a switch, I'm mm -hmm. going to plug it into a rack. Here's a router, but it is networking, just different types oh. of networking. It is, it is very much networking. And, and the network engineers that are worried about their jobs are going to go away or they won't have one in the future, I think it comes down to if they think that, if, if the way they define their job is I'm the guy that logs into the Cisco switch and I configure VLANs, if that is their job, that job might kind of start to become less important and less required. But if yeah. your job is to figure out the best way to connect together, um, uh, systems and services and IoT devices. Um, if your job is to architect security for the network for the, the modern age, if, if your job is to figure out the best way to kind of understand the traffic flows and, and, and build and design networks, um, those jobs aren't going away. They're just changing because the definition of the network is fundamentally changing. It's not just a bunch of Cisco routers and switches anymore. The network embeds itself all the way down into the application layers and into tools like Kubernetes, as we've been talking about today. That's great. I mean, it's. I think it's. Uh, we should have a whole different discussion about it. But this is a great example mm -hmm. of how SDN is changing our roles, and it's that whole thing: adapt yeah. or die. So you either learn the new stuff and make the most of it, because it's just more opportunities if you're prepared to learn. Um, or you, mm -hmm. like you said, you, you, some of your roles might might get lost. You might not be that guy connecting yeah. to the CLI like in the past. Yeah, exactly. Well, let's let's see some of these pieces there. So let's yeah, do sorry, this installation. Hank, so again, keep taking you on. No, no worries. It's these have been great discussions. So again, just as a reminder, because we've been chatting for a bit, I'm going to reinstall the My Hero application, but this time I'm going to install it with the, the application policy for the network policy attached to it. And so it's gonna ask me the pod number, my pod number is 04. And again, this is a sandbox pod that I was assigned when I reserved it this morning. So 04, and it's going ahead and it's installing these applications. So it's pushed this application back out. So let's go look at it in ACI kind of, uh, actually as it spins up because these containers may or may not be there yet. So I'm going to switch over. So now I'm in inside of ACI. I've got the My Hero application profile, and we'll start out with the data one because we'll we'll start at the bottom of the the application tiers. So I pick the data one. Look at my operational tab, and there already we can see the My Hero data endpoint, which is this is the running container is there. If I go look at the application EPG and look at the operational tab, I can see the application container has showing up in ACI in its own EPG. And this is the piece that's important here is I'm now taking each of these elements of these, this application and putting them in the appropriate kind of network segments that are there. And then the UI one, to kind of stick with that, we'll see that the UI one, once again, is lives here inside of this um, endpoint group. Now, what we've done, or what I, I pre-laid before our video started, was the application policies that actually connect these tiers together. And so if I go and look, let's see what this looks like if I bring it up. I can look here, and it's, it's a bit busy and complex because of the different tiers that are there and the external access, but let me see if it'll let me zoom in a little and we can kind of hone in on something. Yeah, it will. All right. And so right here, what I want to show is that I'm going to pull the UI service up here to the top so the arrows are out of the, a little easier to see. So what I can see is the My Hero UI, so the web interface, it has access to the application area. And then these other lines are actually how it's getting access from external internet. So we can come through. 
what you should notice is there's no line connecting the UI to the data. And so my policy yeah. says that if you are, if my UI service gets, gets owned or compromised, the UI should not be able to directly access the data, which is kind of fundamentally what we want. This is the equivalent of putting the firewalls into our kind of a traditional deployment. Is that, you follow along kind of with what the policy is that's, that's set up there. Yeah, it's so logically it's as if there's a firewall or a VLAN or something that's right. blocking those two from talking to each other. The implementation is obviously very different. Yep, and it's it's just it's it's the equivalent of the the ACL concept is what we've done here. We're just doing it inside of the ACI structure. But that's what we see is we see the UI service can get to app but cannot get to the data piece. And so let's let's put this to the test as it goes in. And so what I want to start up with, and I'm going to go to my, my notes cheat sheet here for just a second to find what I want to do, is I'm going to restart. Just wanted to say, Hank, what's nice about this is you can visually see what's going on, whereas with access lists, it was kind of impossible. Yep. Exactly. So let me, there we go. I'm going to start up. Remember, we had that compromised container that I was running some things before and showed that I could get to all of the services in our first example. So I'm going to start this up, and I'm actually going to move it into the UI area. So I'm going to run a couple of commands here, and I'll, I'll show you what I've done when we run these. And so what this command, this command that I ran up here is, this is where I'm actually doing the, the policy assignment. And so this bit that I've just highlighted is saying, put this running container, this dev box container, oops, and I actually did it wrong, because I got to, let me fix it. I want to put it into a particular tenant application profile and then EPG and I need to tell it it's 04. And so what this bit here is, I will highlight it. It rolls over, so bear with the, the roll a little bit, but it says, put this into tenant kube SBX04, so that's the tenant inside of ACI, put it inside application profile my hero, and then put it in the EPG named my hero UI. And so now if I come back over here and we look inside of ACI again, and under My Hero UI, what we should now see is I have dev boxes listed. And so this represents my compromised UI instance. And so now I've compromised one of my web services, and let's see if these security policies are working as expected. And so the first thing I need to know is I need to know the IP addresses that the, the services that are there. So I'm gonna do a kube CTL, My Hero, get pods dash o wide. So this is going to tell me what the IP addresses are assigned to each one of these running containers. And so I can see the application one is assigned 20408, um, and the data one is assigned 2040135, and you can see the, the dev box has one as well. We're having a bit of a windstorm here at the at the house, and apparently it's just doing numbers with my uh, my stuff here. So we are back after my second power outage of today's video, but we are right back where we were. Uh, and so again, as what we've got here is I'm looking at the actual IP addresses that are assigned, and so we can see the UI address, we can see the dat the data IP address, we can see the app. And I've put the dev box into the same security segment as UI. So we're going to represent the dev box as our compromised uh, web service. And so what I should be able to do is ping one of these application containers. So 10.204.08. And so this should work because, again, the UI should be able to reach the application tier. It should work, but of course it's not going to. All right, we'll give this a, oh, I know why it's not working. Let's uh, try this again, because I don't have, ping isn't allowed, it's it's the, uh, it's just the API calls um, on that. So this will work, is I'm gonna make an API call from here into the application tier um, to verify that the, the segmentation is working on this piece. So key equals secure app, and then 10.204.08, and it runs on port 5000, and then options. And so this works. And so I was able from my compromised UI service to access the API tier, the application tier. We should be able to do that. Um, that's expected. 
But what I shouldn't be able to do is very specifically target the data tier. So let's try to make an API call to the data service. So curl uh, dash h, the key for this is secure data. And 10, 204, data is 135, right? Yep. And options. And so if I let this sit here, this will sit here and eventually it'll time out because what's happening is that the traffic from the UI EPG is not allowed to reach the data. So it's trying, but ACI is preventing it from going through. So I'm gonna control C to get rid of that and go through. So we verified that we can't actually get there. Now to show that the, the, the stuff, the networking is actually working, let's just for a minute, we're gonna move the dev box from the UI network segment to the app network segment to show that now that data connection would work because the app, the API tier should be able to access it. And so if I go ahead and I'm gonna move from My Hero UI to My Hero app. And so what I'm doing here again, this is just changing inside of Kubernetes, just a bit of an annotation, just a label that says, okay, now put this in the application. I've updated that. We'll go verify inside of ACI that it actually is working. So we'll switch back to app. So now under operational, we can now see the dev box now shows up underneath the app EPG, so I've moved it. And so now if I remake that API call to the data service, it works successfully because the ACI segmentation policy says the application service needs to be able to access the data tier. That's what our policy says. And so the key here is now I've been able to actually take my microservice application architecture and very easily map that into the actual network architecture under the hood. So I've been able to put the, the Kubernetes application piece together with the network structure. And that's kind of, this is, this is a great example of why we call ACI application-centric infrastructure, is the goal is to actually do this, is to combine the application pieces with the network, and so they go along together. Now, one of the things I mentioned is when I deployed this application as the application developer, what I did is there's just a, a note, there's that annotation that says each deployment or each uh, tier of my application, which network segment it goes in. And so we can take a look real quick at what those look like. And so we'll do, I'm gonna use less and we'll look at, we'll look at um, UI.yaml. All right, so this here, this is a YAML file definition. That's what Kubernetes uses to define all of the objects inside of Kubernetes. So these are the deployments, the services, kind of all of those pieces. And so if I come down here, what we're looking, looking at right here inside of this part of the deployment, we can see that this is a deployment. It's the My Hero UI deployment. And this little bit here, this annotations, and then the linkage off to the particular tenant application pro profile and EPG, this is what the application developers put inside of their definitions. And now the way they know what to put is because they do need to talk to security and networking so that we have an understanding of what these application needs are. So we put the policy in place inside of the network. But then after that, once the policies are mapped, the application developers can simply apply those networking policies at their deployment time. They don't need to ask the networking team or the security team to onboard a new container. They just deploy this with these pieces that are there and it'll all link appropriately because of that integration between ACI and Kubernetes. Does that make sense, David? Yeah, so another silly analogy is this kind of like, uh, I know this might not apply and might not make sense, but it's kind of like a label. So I'm, I'm just marking this thing with a label, like an MPLS, like a, this packet is a label and that gets put into the right VPN. Is that, is, is that a valid analogy kind of thing? The analogy is there, but I didn't use the word label myself because label actually is, is another keyword inside of Kubernetes. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can, if there's any in here. Yeah. So if I scroll up inside of this definition, see where it's, Kubernetes has this label and then I've got app and tier. And so the, the word label means something to Kubernetes, which is why they use the word annotation. Labels are things that Kubernetes is using for itself. And this is how some of the linkages goes through. Annotations can be used through integrations. So 
ACI uses annotations for its labeling so it knows what security policy to put. Um, if you integrate something like Nginx or um, let's say a load balancer from, from F5 or Citrix and it's integrating in with, a, with Kubernetes, it would use an annotation so that it knew what to do. Okay. And so I'd just be cautious with the word label because that means something inside of Kubernetes and you could drive some confusion. Well, that makes sense. Yeah, so the developer is, is basically adding this annotation after talking to the network guys, security guys. And basically, I'm just, um, this annotation mm -hmm. means it belongs in this, um, sorry, what was it, EPG? And the EPGs is how you enforce the security. Is that right? Yep, it is. And that's that's the area. So the, the And again, the, the piece that's important here, and this is the part that I think is the most interesting for me, is that we've always had this these demarcation points and these silos inside of enterprises where the network team and the security team and the application team sometimes it, sometimes in some organizations it feels like they they work for different companies like they don't want to talk to each other they 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 they, they hate when they have to have meetings together and and I get some of the history behind that but this is another part of this evolution with SDN and some of these other areas is that it's going to be important for networking and security engineers to have conversations with their application engineers and their application developers to understand what the applications need so that they can develop the policies and make sure the segmentation is in place. Because somebody has to understand the networking elements of these applications if we're going to have micro-segmentation and, and segmentation security policies that are there. And this is, I think, where the, the, the integration or the interest for, for network engineers to understand modern application development and technologies like Kubernetes will be important because we're going to have to have these tight conversations with our application peers in order to be successful in the future. Yeah, I think it's a really good point. I think the, um, the knowledge for network engineers is broadening a lot. You, you can't just be a specialist, say, on this. In mm -hmm. some cases, you might still be but you can't just be a network guy. You've got to understand a lot of other domains now, because you because that 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 um, right. the connect it's very tightly coupled. I, I don't really want to use that that term, but it, I mean mm -hmm. we have to talk to those guys and understand what the network needs to provide for the applications. Because at the end of the day, let's be honest, people don't care about the network; they care about the application. They go to Facebook. They don't care how they get there. Mm -hmm. Exactly, and I, I, I use the word tightly coupled, and, and that's one of the things I talk a lot about in this kind of evolution of the network engineer role in this programmable age and pieces that go through, is we're going to be building networks, or, or in the future, somebody is going to be building networks inside of Linux servers to, to handle containers. They're going to be building networks for clouds, and they're going to be building networks for platforms like Kubernetes. If you want to be a network engineer kind of dealing with those areas, then you have to broaden your skill set. You have to yeah. understand some fundamentals of Linux. You have to understand some fundamentals of, of how Docker containers work. And then very clearly, you have to understand some fundamentals of things like Kubernetes if you're going to build and manage and work with a network that's there. Um, I like that personally. Yeah. I like being able to kind of expose myself and understand the pieces. You don't need to be a Kubernetes expert, right? I don't expect every network engineer to understand how to build a Kubernetes cluster from scratch or know every underpinning or, or be a, a follower of kind of the latest Kubernetes releases. But you need to understand what a deployment and a pod is and how services link together because this is where the networking elements of Kubernetes come in. And whether you use ACI or some other um, networking solution for Kubernetes to deliver these capabilities, you have to understand the kind of the fundamentals of what's there and what the options are. Um, I'm excited because Cisco has kind of gone all in on yeah. kind of making sure that the Cisco networking platforms and technologies and skill sets will continue to be relevant inside of these new worlds like Kubernetes and inside of the cloud. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. I mean, the our roles are changing, but the great thing is Cisco, it feels like are, are ahead of the game here because it... it I don't know if this is true, but they're sort of it, there's, some guys are saying that VMware are going to be um, hit by containers and stuff like that. So we we evolving from physical machines to VMs and now to containers, and it's great to see that Cisco are quite heavily involved here. Mm -hmm. But Hank, we get to the next question. So okay, this is brilliant, but how do I practice? Have you got a lab that I can access? I think you said there's a DevNet lab that I can <sighs> access. Is that right? So I want to try this Absolutely. now myself because I want yeah. to, most guys will learn by doing rather than talking. So what, mm -hmm. can you demo or just show us how to get 
to this lab? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's definitely where I want to make sure we, we, we hone in on here. So the DevNet Sandbox, hopefully by now everybody's got uh, some familiarity, but DevNet Sandbox are our hosted labs that provide access to it. And if I come over here, what we're going to look at is um, the DevNet, and we're going to start with the catalog, I think. Um, you can see yeah, if you can go right yeah, at the beginning. Okay. So like we go to developer.cisco.com, uh, don't we? And then it, then how do we get to where, where, you, where we are now? Yeah. So if you want to explore and kind of dive into some of these ACI and Kubernetes integration and have your own cluster to go through, we've made that really easy. And I'm super excited about all the hard work and, and kind of having the chance to put this out so that everybody in the community can snag it. So as always, you can start out at DevNet, which is here, developer.cisco.com. And then right on the main page, we've got the link for the sandbox. And so inside of the catalog, what you'll find, let me get the catalog open. What you'll find in the catalog right at the beginning, because A is at the start of the alphabet, so luckily it's start at the very beginning, is this <laughs> ACI and Kubernetes reservable sandbox. And so if you click the reserve button, it'll let you reserve your very own sandbox infrastructure. What every sandbox infrastructure comes with is everything you need to build a Kubernetes cluster and then integrate it together with ACI and run through an experiment with some of the stuff like we've gone through today. And so what you end up with is you end up with an ACI fabric. And so you actually get access to the same controller that I've been using since today's demos. You're given credentials as part of your reservation that you log in and manipulate your assigned tenant for your cluster. You get access to four virtual machines. Um, that will act as your Kubernetes cluster. And so you'll get what we call the dev box. This is the developer workstation. You can think about this as where, where the Kubernetes administrator is gonna go through. And so that's where you would, you would see me, you've seen me running all the Kubernetes commands from, is from that dev box. And so you'll get your very own one of those. And then you'll get kub01, 02, and 03. And that's where the Kubernetes cluster will be built. Now at reservation, we've done the prep work. The VMs are ready, they're networked together, the ACI fabric is prepped for the integration. What you get to do is you actually get to walk through the steps of installing Kubernetes and then doing that integration together. But I've made it easier, right? I didn't wanna have, okay, here's a bunch of links to Kubernetes documentation. I built what I call the quick start guide. So let me go ahead and open up the quick start guide. And so the quick start guide, I've got it posted up on GitHub so that I can keep it maintained pretty easily, is this will walk you through inside of the sandbox everything necessary to connect to your infrastructure, prepare all of the components and do the pieces. And so you can just follow along through this quick start guide. You'll get the definitions of everything that you're given access to. You'll see screenshots of what to expect. And then you'll see the commands necessary to do all the preparation for the development workstation as well as do the installation that's there. Um, and go through on that. And so we've given you everything necessary to get from kind of no Kubernetes installed at all to getting Kubernetes installed, going ahead and integrating that with, with ACI so we get the networking in place. And then the last step that is involved is actually kind of deploying your initial My Hero application into Kubernetes, kind of in that default mode that you go through. And actually, I'm working, they won't be out by the time we initially release this video, but I'm working on adding more, more content to these quick start guides and learning labs that'll walk you through actually doing some of the other areas. So building application policies and deploying the application with segmentation and, and kind of testing the pieces. And so this is a sandbox that I'm actively using to build more of this content to help folks understand this integration between Cisco and ACI and Kubernetes that's out there. That's fantastic. I mean, when when we were speaking about or spoke initially about this call, it was like, Hank, so what on earth does Cisco have to do with Kubernetes and applications and stuff? And it's it's been really great to see that because I think you've explained that extremely well. I can see exactly how ACI works with you know Kubernetes, whereas before mm -hmm. it was like whatever. So thanks so much for you know explaining this and. Hank, thanks so much for putting a lab together because I think most of us will learn by actually doing it. So it's fantastic that we can both sort of get your opinion about it and your input, but also get to do the lab. So thanks very much. No, you're absolutely welcome. And uh, this is a great call. It's actually, it's a topic that I'm, I'm speaking on quite a bit these days. And, and next week I'm headed out to Cisco's um, engineering conference. 
so that I can, and I'm gonna be presenting and kind of walking folks through the same piece. So this is kind of fresh, hot off the presses material and pieces. So I hope all the viewers kind of enjoyed the call and get a chance to try this out on their own. And be sure to let us know through comments and Twitter, kind of any of the other pieces that uh, you've got questions or some element, if you get a chance to play with the lab and something didn't work quite right, by all means, let me know, because the, the goal here is to kind of help every network engineer understand these pieces so that they can kind of be ready for this when it comes to you in your in your your actual job, if it hasn't already. That's brilliant. So just again, how do you, if, if guys have feedback, can they just comment below this video? Will you see that or is there a better way to get hold of you? Mm -hmm. So I am watching the videos, so by all means you can drop them there and I'll keep an eye on it. But you can also reach out um, on Twitter. So I'm fairly active up on Twitter, at HF Preston. You can find me on Twitter. Um, I post uh, updates to labs, learning labs that are out there, interesting pieces of information that are there. But I also love to engage with the community, um, help people answer questions, point them in the right direction, and go through on that. So the, the, the Twitter channel is always a great way to kind of stay connected as well. That's great. So everyone, please follow Hank on Twitter. And um, please, if you want to make comments below this video, but if you want Hank's input, send him a tweet. Hank, again, thanks so much for spending so much time with me today and showing this, uh, well, I think amazing demo and kind of explaining how we got from you know, monolithic single applications to this amazing stuff that we use today. So thanks again. You are absolutely welcome, and uh, I'll talk to you again next week. Where the, we're not sure what we're talking about yet, but we'll come up with something equally as exciting.